Hey there again. Today we're going to talk on this uh, particular chapter, we're going to talk about social beliefs and judgments. That is, we're going to talk about um, how, in fact, we, we had mentioned it briefly at the beginning. It's a really good, uh, big topic for social psych. That there are uh, two things in the world. There's reality and there's reality that we perceive. Which is more important to you, the reality you perceive, right? And so that's what this is kind of about, is um, things that might make your perception of reality differ from actual reality, if that makes any sense. Well, we'll find out, huh? So, as we said, we respond not to reality, but to reality as we believe it to be, okay? And I'm going to talk about different examples here of um, how that works, okay? The, uh, I'm going to expand each of these, these ones on these next slides. First off, um, first impressions are more often right than wrong. It's amazing. Uh, people think that they can't hide, uh, that they can hide their uh, attitudes and beliefs. No, 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 no. In fact, they did a brief study one time, uh, a study one time when they they videotaped the professor in the classroom for five seconds on the first day of class, five seconds on a class in the middle of the semester, and five seconds on the last day of class. And they took this three five second video clips and they played them to a group of experimental participants and they said now we want you to give student evaluations on this professor and they're like dude I just watched three five second clips like, okay and gave their student evals and lo and behold the student evaluations of the um, the students that only saw 15 seconds matched almost 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 exactly matched the student evaluations given by the students in the actual classes so it was really kind of an amazing thing um, here though Related to this, our beliefs are shaped. Uh, our beliefs shape our interpretation of what we see. Okay, so we have these first impressions, and now these impressions that we have. So let's say, for example, here was one where they had some students. I mean, this is this is what, uh, kind of an odd one, but some students were rated as pro-Israeli and some were rated as pro-Arab, and then they watched a news program. It doesn't even matter what it was, and uh, they asked the students who were pro-Israeli. How um, anti was this an anti-Israeli media presentation or not? Yes or no? And I mean, look at this. It, it, depending on their preconceived beliefs, it de uh, determined on how they they what they saw. And I mean, we saw this much earlier when we talked about the Dartmouth versus Princeton football game, right? If you're a fan of Dartmouth, then you see what you want to see. If you're a fan of Princeton, you see what you want to see. Uh, belief perseverance is this uh, persistence of your initial belief, even when there's no reason to think of it anymore. And it's got to do with that first impressions. We have these belief systems, and they color everything else after that. And the problem is, is once we have this, these beliefs, they, they are, we are stubborn to get rid of them. Um, eventually, children stop believing in Santa Claus, but, you know, they really hold out. Um, but see, this is a problem. It's as soon as somebody is uh, accused of a crime, whether they did it or not, their reputation is ruined forever. You can never, you can never take that back. And um, I always felt bad for poor Michael Jackson um, when he was accused of child molestation because it was just it. The truth didn't matter. The truth was absolutely irrelevant. Once those words were out there, people believed it, no matter how much evidence came out otherwise. Though I don't know about it. He might have been true, but you know that's another question. Um. Another one that uh, messes with our, our social worlds, this, this comes from cognitive psychology. And so this example is more cognitive in nature. But I want you to know that our memory system, I mean, in order to um, adequately interact with other human beings, we need to remember prior social interactions, right? That's not like every time we have a social interaction, we set the reset button, right? We have to have a memory. And... Um, so therefore, the memory that we have to bring into the system is far from perfect. Here's, here's, a, here's an example for you. 85% <clears throat> of college students agree with this statement. Memory can be likened to a storage chest in the brain into which we deposit material and from which we can withdraw it later if needed. Occasionally, something is lost from the chest, and then we say we have forgotten. That is so idiotic. That is not how memory works, yet 85% of college students agree with that. And, and I mean, that, that's the way most of the world thinks. Um... It's like, instead, uh, memory is more like a safety deposit box at the bank where you come back in a week, and if you put $10 in and you come back in a week, you might have $8 left, or you might have $12 left, because guess what? Things not just get forgotten, but things get added, and sometimes things get changed so completely that when you go back to your uh, safety deposit box, you find that you have Canadian currency, right? 
or some other funky Japanese yen or something, you know? You don't know what's going to come out of it, okay? In a classic study, this is a, uh, Elizabeth Loftus' study, she took and um, she videotaped a automobile accident. Two cars were driving around the back. Okay, videotaped it. Now, she had a bunch of students watch this accident. They all watched the exact same videotape. At the end of the, the video, she asked half of the students, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? And they were like, I don't know, 28 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, something. Somewhere around, let's, let's keep it simple, an average of 30. Second group, she says, again, they watch the exact same video, and she says, how fast were the cars driving when they smashed into each other? And it was like, oh, man, 47 miles an hour? All right. And so simply by using the word hit versus smashed in, in her questioning, they watch the same video. And by using this simple word, they change their belief system by like 15, 18 miles an hour. Now, this is cool, but now it gets really cool if we go further. Okay, thank you very much. Go on home. And she calls him back in in a month and says, okay, was there glass at the scene of the accident? And now those people who had been asked how fast were the cars going when they hit each other said 30 miles an hour. And so therefore they now have a constructed memory. Now they're trying to remember, remember the accident, but it doesn't come out. It doesn't come out like we said, like, you know, putting it into a box. It's like constructed. It's changed. It's modified. And so they have 30 miles an hour as their basis upon which to create this memory. The one that said smashed uh, has a 45, 47, whatever we said, 47 mile an hour accident as a basis to construct their memory. And so you ask them, was there glass at the accident? And those people that you had said hit had this memory which was constructed based on 30 miles an hour. And they're like, you know, 30 miles an hour, that's a fender bender in the neighborhood. No, I did not see glass. They're not pulling out their memory of whether or not they saw glass. They're pulling out their this constructed memory based on 30 miles an hour. The group that you said smashed, 47, they're much more likely to say, yes, there was glass. And again, it's not that they're pulling out from their memory the presence or absence of glass. But it said the construction of their memory based on that 30 versus 47 that they just stated. Okay? That's how memory works. Okay? So, children's memories are particularly suggestible. Um, it's really easy to implant the memory into children. Um, all you got to do is just grill them hard enough. You just, did you see the purple squirrel? Did you see the purple squirrel? You sure you didn't see the purple squirrel? Are you positive? Then you just got to add a couple of details if your kids are stubborn. The purple squirrel, it was up on the uh, the electrical uh, electrical wire. Didn't you see it when we were driving? Don't you remember it was throwing nuts at us? And pretty soon, you add a couple more details, and pretty soon the kids are going to go, Oh, that purple squirrel! And the kids are going to start to add in their own little details, and they're going to start to remember it. And once they have this memory in their head, they cannot distinguish between fantasy and reality. It's just, you can't. They can't distinguish between them. Um, and this is somewhat troublesome when they use uh, children's memory in a court of law. Uh, it's not that children cannot remember. It's just that um, the lawyers involved are not neutral. The lawyers involved have an agenda, and they can plant these false memories very, very quickly. And once they're planted, the children cannot tell the difference between truth and reality. The child can be up there, do you swear to tell the truth the whole truth, and truly believe what's coming out of their mouth. Okay. Um, so, based on this idea, that was like cognitive in nature, but now let's bring it back to social. Um, we can't even, you know, re reconstruct our own past attitudes. You know, we don't remember what we did. It, this thing called rosy retrospection, I can, I can still remember this, um, this vacation that my family took uh, about four years ago to uh, Disney World. And uh, we were there, and it was miserable. It was, it was really, it was really hard, you know. But now we look back on that trip to Disneyland and go, that was really good, wasn't it? I mean, it was. We got to do every single theme park there. We uh, no one got hurt. Um, it was a fairly affordable in, uh, trip. Um, you know, we rode every single ride. That was pretty good. And so we remember backwards and, and our 
recalled memories are not the same as our actual. There was another study one time that asked women every single day to recall what their moods were. And then they, at the end of the month, they had them uh, recall what their moods were for the past month. And it turned out that women, when you ask them to recall um, uh, the last month, they remember really bad PMS. But if you ask women day to day to day, they don't, they don't, they don't report those changes in mood that you report if you ask them in, at the month long thing. Ah, whatever, that was kind of a neat one. Um, we reconstruct our past behaviors. Uh, we, we remember behaviors in such a way to make ourselves look good. Um, people, you know, when you say, did you vote in the last election, people's, uh, the percent of people saying, yes, they voted in the last election far exceeds the number of people that actually voted in the election. Um, you ask people how many cigarettes they smoked, and then you count the butts in their car, and it's just, you know, it doesn't matter. People's memories are constructed in such a way to match the social reality that they would like to have. All right, um, and again, here's a little bit more cognitive psych for you. We seem to think and make decisions on a dual track system, okay? At one level, it's explicit, and at another level, it's automatic. As I said, we're going we're gonna to break this apart in, in some detail when we get to uh, prejudice. Um, turns out that, you know, there's two different types of prejudice, blatant prejudice and subtle prejudice. One is controlled and one is automatic, and um, blatant prejudice is disappearing. Uh, but the uh, the subtle prejudice is not okay, and so what happens is we think we know things, but our brain knows things that we don't know we know. Oh shit, that sounds Freudian, doesn't it? I don't like Freud. Okay, so it's really kind of interesting. We can have, uh, and we do have, social judgments that are occurring that are not at our conscious level that we can't control that are beyond our abilities. Um, blah, 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 I said it. Okay, we can know things without being aware. Say here, for example, they what they did was um, they had little Chinese characters, and just before the Chinese character, they would flash up in, in this, uh, like a smiley face, like this, and then they would show up a Chinese character. Smiley face, Chinese character, you know, and then frowny face, a different Chinese character and stuff. And then afterward, they would show the Chinese characters and say, what is your opinion of these characters? And people are like, that is just nasty. That one is just gross. What's wrong with it? Why is it so bad? I have no idea why. I, I don't have a single clue why I don't like it. I just don't like it. And so people can have this judgment. In this case, it's judgment of a Chinese character. And have no conscious access to why they like or dislike it. None at all. And yet, it can drive their behavior immensely. And it can work the same way with um, social judgments. You, you can have these incredible social um, aversions or, or to things and not have any clue and have no access to why they happen. Okay? Uh, confidence, okay. Again, this is, this is cognitive psych again. So, but, you know, it is what it is. We have cognitive limitations in our interactions with the social world. Um, confidence is a good thing because it's higher motivation. It um, allows us to persist at things, you know, uh, to to stay on track. It gives us energy and optimism and things like that. Um, having confidence makes us happier. But what happens is um, we are much more confident than we are correct in all judgments. I mean, again, the, I'm talking cognitive psych, but of course I'm relating this in the social psych because. Um, I mean, let's say very briefly, um, they did, well, they've did. they done a lot of different studies, but here's one. They'll, they'll ask people a bunch of simple questions. You know, What's the capital of North Dakota? And like, Bismarck. I don't know, whatever. Is it Pierre? Pierre, South Dakota? Bismarck, North? Whatever. So anyway, they'll ask these people, you know, um, these questions, hundreds of questions. And then after each question, they'll say, how confident are you that you got the answer correct? And it doesn't really matter what the questions are. People are much more confident they are than they are correct. That's what overconfidence is about, okay? And now, if we straight take this forward into the social realm, what this means is we are much more confident of our knowledge of other people than we're accurate. That's the definition, because this overconfidence phenomenon extends to every single realm. 
There's n almost no correlation between confidence and accuracy. I like this. Um, men are more confident. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> They're over 30 is much more confident. Uh, okay, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Eh, cute. Uh, whatever. 82% of people say they're in the top 30% of safe drivers. I don't know. Mathematically, that doesn't exactly make much sense, right? And like I said, it doesn't really matter what you study. Here's four different things on this page. It's all the same. Overconfidence is just really strong. Um, and overconfidence is fed by the confirmation bias, a tendency to search for information that con confirms our perceptions. Um, this is a silly example with the weather patterns, but it turns out, again, from a social realm, this is social psych, um, if we believe somebody's a bad person, we are going to seek out information that confirms our belief that they're a bad person rather than seeking out information to disconfirm it. If we think somebody's bad, we're not going to start looking and say, I wonder if I can find something good about them to disconfirm my belief. No, we're going to seek to confirm. What we, and so we're going to selectively ignore things on and actively seek out particular types of information. All right, now this is cool, judging our social world heuristics. Heuristics are mental shortcuts. How about this? Um, all day long, you're making thousands of uh, judgments and decisions, thousands, millions of judgments and decisions. Um, let's keep it simple again from a social perspective. Um, I mean, of course, I'm, well, I mean, from a, from a cognitive perspective, would I enjoy a Kit Kat bar more or a Milky Way bar more today if I could only buy one? Something like that, you know? And we don't, like, suffice it to say, if you were taking my cognitive class, we could talk about, you know, the mathematical rules of decision making, you know, like uh, probability theory that you learned in your statistics class, which is like, what is the probability of this? Da, 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 and, uh, but with heuristics, what happens is we recognize that we make thousands and thousands of decisions every single day. We just don't have the cognitive ability to stop and think about them, to stop and mathematically, logically analyze. We can't logically analyze every decision we make. If we did, we'd run out of time in our lives. We'd have nothing left, okay? So what happens is we, we use these little mental shortcuts called heuristics. And so the majority of the time you're like, which, you know, which, which would be better if I make the left turn here or go straight here? And we just might go, ding, ding, and we do it. Are we right? Yeah, sometimes. Are we wrong? Yeah, sometimes. But they're more often correct than incorrect, and they allow us to make things quickly. Okay, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a social realm. Okay, so here, da, 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 da. There's, there's a variety of types of heuristics. I'm going to talk about three, okay? The representativeness heuristic is a rule of thumb for judging the likelihood of things in terms of how well they seem to represent or match particular prototypes. Okay, here for example, Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Please choose the most likely alternative. Do you think it's more likely that Linda is a bank teller or that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement? Okay. Now, I could pause right now and have you all email me your, your, your answers to this, okay? But I already know what the answer is going to be. By far, the majority of you are going to say Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement is more likely. And, uh, and it, it's, the reason is because right up front, when we read this little story, there is not a single, you know, it doesn't say, and Linda likes to play with numbers. Okay, well, duh. I mean, it doesn't say anything in here that makes us think Linda's a bank teller. There's not a single thing in here that screams bank teller, right? In other words, there's nothing in this description that represents a bank teller. But there are certain aspects of this that represent a, a feminist, right? Major in philosophy. What more could I possibly say, right? Um... Deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice. I mean, these are the types, these are things that make you think maybe feminist, okay? They don't make you think bank teller. But when we stop and think about it here on this slide, we see, look, if the, you know, there's a Venn diagram, logic class for you. If the circle on the left represents all of the bank tellers in the world, and the circle on the right represents all of the feminists in the world, the overlap between the two, the shaded area, 
by definition, must be significantly smaller than the entire world of bank tellers, right? Because we're talking about a subcategory of bank tellers. So which is more likely, that Linda is a member of a large group or Linda is a member of a much smaller group? That doesn't make much sense, okay? Yet we do this all the time. When something looks like something, we just jump for it. These are going to be the basis of um, stereotypes, right? That's what, that's what stereotypes are all about and where they come from. The, I'm going to spend more time on this later, but suffice it to say, um, this is true. These heuristics are quick mental shortcuts, but we find that um, our clinicians are making these quick mental shortcuts, perhaps inaccurately. Later on, in fact, we're going to find that um, they, they did this one study, just very briefly, just so that you kind of know what this slide is. They did this study where they had, um, they asked doctors, do you believe that this patient will be readmitted? Okay, and what's the probability you believe that, etc. And, and then they, they at, at time of discharge, they simply measured the thickness of the patient's medical files. And it turns out that the thickness of a patient's medical file was a much better predictor of readmission than the doctor's estimations. Because doctors were using some kind of uh, represent, I don't know what the hell they were doing, but they weren't doing it right. The availability heuristic is an interesting heuristic. Estimating the likelihood of events based on their availability and memory. And by the way, I'm going to have an, an enhanced uh, discussion of these heuristics in the uh, paper two discussion. Okay, So availability heuristic is the estimating the likelihood of events based on their availability and memory. So if something comes readily to mind, we just assume it's common. And this makes a lot of sense, you know. Um, Basically, if I've seen something a thousand times and I close my eyes, I ought to have a fairly strong memory of that because I've seen it a thousand times. I mean, that's how it works. If I've only seen something a few times, close your eyes and your memory ought to not be very strong. Therefore, if I close my eyes and the memory is something very strong, then it's probably because it's something that's very common. Okay, and it makes a lot of sense because that is how the world works. Okay, the more times you see something, the stronger the memory is. And so, if we look into our brain and we see a strong memory, then we say it must be something likely. But there's a lot of reasons why one thing might have a more vivid memory than another because it's easier to visualize. It happened very recently. It's very emotional to us. Um, something like this. There's a lot of reasons something has a strong memory not just because it's frequent. However, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm going to repeat it, heuristics are, are usually correct and they allow us to make these decisions very, very quickly. So they're very adaptive, but they're not, they're not always correct. What causes more deaths in America? Shark attacks or falling airplane parts? And so you close your eyes and you think of memory of shark attacks. Ah, gotcha. And you think of memory of falling airplane part deaths. I ain't got nothing. Okay. So in the last couple of years, we keep seeing the uh, images of that uh, one-armed surfer chick. You know, the, I guess her name was Brittany. She got her arm bit off. She was surfing, and now she's some. She's out surfing on the pro sur tur circuit with one arm and shit. And so she keeps popping up on the news, and so that always makes me think about shark attacks and stuff. But guess what? Brittany didn't die. That was zero deaths by shark attack, no matter how many times I see Brittany, okay? Um, Jaws was a movie. It was pretend. Anybody remember a couple years ago was the summer of the shark. Ooh, they were everywhere. There was zero deaths, okay? People don't die from shark attacks. People die from falling airplane parts. You're sitting in your living room and you're watching the Andy Griffith show and it comes through your roof. Bang, you're dead. All right, it's amazing how many airplane parts fall, but no airline wants to talk about them, okay? So one comes to mind more easily, and so we assume it's more frequent. This is one of my favorites, the recognition heuristic. It's just so simple, and uh, it's one that I can really, really, really pull into social psychology. Uh, but anyway, this is great. If we simply recognize a brand name, we judge it more positively. I like this. Researchers ask people to pick which of two airlines to fly on, Joe's Airline or American. And people are like, dude, American, okay? They're like, okay, did you know American Airlines pilots are drunk? 
Why do you want to fly it? American or uh, Joe's Air? American. Did you know that the mechanics for American Airlines aren't even certified? Which would, you know, and it's like you had to just slam the shit out of American Airlines before they would jump on the Joe's Airline. I mean, they really didn't want Joe's Airline, even though Joe's Airline had nothing bad going for it. Um, another study, what they did was they, uh, they gave little kids the uh, fast food wrapped up in McDonald's wrappers and fast food wrapped up in uh, white, plain white paper. And they asked the kids to, you know, compare these two. And, of course, you know, the kids eat the one in the plain white wrapper. And boo, boo, what is this crap you're trying to serve me? Blah, yuck. And then they eat the McDonald's one and they don't even chew it. Up. And, of course, the trick is it's the exact same food. Right? It's the exact same food. If it's in a McDonald's wrapper, it's good. If it's in a plain white wrapper, it's crap. And it's the exact same product. And so we find that this is a, a very sensible thing. Here's, in fact, a, a, a very good social, social judgment situation. Um, I'm walking down the street. Somebody is approaching me. Okay? Here's the deal. If I, if I recognize the person that's coming toward me, I should be much more eager to approach them than if it's a, a stranger. Because I'm approaching and there's Bill. I've interacted with Bill. I recognize Bill. I'm familiar with Bill. And guess what? In all of my social interactions with Bill, he never once killed me. Therefore, I probably can assume that Bill is a good guy that I can interact with again. Here comes this other dude. I've never seen him before. Since I've never seen him before, he may well be a guy that's going to kill me. How would I know? Okay? We are designed to trust things that we recognize. And it makes sense. I mean... I'm dying of starvation, and there's two foods in front of me, and, and an apple and a kumquat. Which should I prefer, an apple? Why? Because in the past I've had apples and they didn't kill me. Kumquats, what the hell do I know? All right? If you're not familiar, you should be hesitant, okay? It's just a survival value, whether that familiarity be a food, McDonald's food, an airline that you fly on, or a people, people that you interact with. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, is there any really good example in there? Uh, deciding that Carlos is a librarian rather than a trucker because he better represents one's image of librarians. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we often, again, this is related to, say, preconceived notions and stuff, but we often perceive relationships where none exist. Um, if we uh, have a preconceived belief that uh, it's all also got to do with the selective attention, if we have a preconceived belief that uh, a certain group is a bad group of people, we're going to start to see a correlation between the number of crimes and the number of people. It, it's, it's just... We're going to see things that aren't there. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, I guess so. If you put people in a... I guess what they did was they, in this study, they videotaped people. And then they put them in either a good mood or a bad mood. And then they had them watch their own videotape. And if you put them into a good mood, they, they detect... Um, more, oh, oh lord, this is kind of ugly, but if you put them into a good mood, they detect more positive behaviors in their own videotape, and if you put them into a bad mood, they detect more negative behaviors in their own videotape, it's, it's kind of a confusing graph, but that's what it was, uh, this is an interesting one, moods and in how they influence judgment, this is very interesting, um, well, how do I put this? They had a game, a gambling game, and um, this gambling game was literally a game of probability. It was a mathematical game. Therefore, there should not have been emotion in it. It should have been removed from emotions. Well, it turned out that um, you take this purple line on the far left. After, you know, you take these regular people, and when they win, there's a 62% chance that they'll... they'll they'll gamble or something. You know, if they won, there's a 62% chance that they'll, they'll gamble again on the next trial. If they lose, there's a 41% chance that they'll gamble. The idea is that um, 
Remember, this is a mathematical game. It needs, it should be removed from emotions. Yet, if people win, they stick with it, and people lose, they go away from it. And it shouldn't influence them. It shouldn't. And so, and lo and behold, take a look at the far right line. What you have is a patient who, particular patients at hospitals that have um, emotion problems. They just don't have the ability to, to uh, feel emotions. And lo and behold, these patients that don't have the ability to feel emotions, they, um, th their, their, uh, their behavior is not, in fact, affected by whether or not they win or lost. They're able to display pure rationality. They're able to, every single trial is a separate event. You see, it doesn't matter if they just lost or just won. Um, it, it's really, I mean, it's strong. It's, it's, it's a, it's an adapt, it's a strategy. Well, whatever. It, it's interesting that our moods can influence our judgments is really what the point is. Uh, oh, this now, okay, now we're into a big one. Attribution theory. This is huge. Um, all day long, we're running around in, in our social interactions we're making attributions. An attribution is an explanation of causality or something like that. Um, an attribution is, do I, I, don't, I don't have it. But anyway, here's the deal. When I see somebody's behavior, though it's, it's more, I'll, I'll keep it simplish. I see Tabitha walks into my classroom late. And I could think to myself one of two things. One, Tabitha's late because she's a bad person and just doesn't give a shit. Or two, Tabitha is late because there was no parking spaces and they had closed off the campus and she had to park, away, you know, five blocks away. Which do I think is the explanation for Tabitha's behavior? And so these two things really come down to the person or the situation. Is Tabitha late because she's a bad person or is Tabitha late because the particular situation she's in created such a situation, whatever, such an outcome? Okay, and so attribution theory is the theory of how people explain others' behaviors. Okay, whether we explain them to an enduring internal disposition or whether it's an external situational thing, and there's, I mean, there's really, we're gonna, I'm gonna describe this further as I go. But suffice it to say, in fact, let me let me put up this one real quick just to give you an idea. If I here's this dude, look at him, he's pissed off, right? Here's the deal. If I believe that this dude is just a bad dude, this man is a hostile person, I'm going to have an unfavorable reaction. I don't like him, period. But if I believe the reason he's acting this way is because he was unfairly evaluated and things were not cool for him, then I'm be like, you know what, I can understand him. I'll tolerate his behavior and I'll still like him later. Okay? And so the attribution that we give to a behavior clearly influences how we react to it in a social sense okay so going back to attribution a misattribution is getting it wrong we miss misattribute many many times okay Kelly's theory of attributions is um, is interesting I like it um, according to Kelly we do three different things when creating an attribution, right? So in comes um, uh, Tabitha. Tabitha comes in late. And so I'm going to make three different thought processes in my head. Number one, consensus. Is Tabitha the only one being late or um, is it other people that are late too? Okay. Now, if everybody's starting to be late, I'm going to be like, okay, there's an accident on the highway. Okay. But if it's just Tabitha, uh-oh, okay. Let me move forward. I'm also going to make a decision, or, or you know, make a consideration. Does everyone be? Or no, does Tabitha behave the same in other classes? Okay, is Tabitha only late for this class, or is Tabitha late for every class? Okay, is this a distinct behavior from her, or is it something that is consistent with her, or in consistency? Um, not just here, but in other classes, and then consistency. Is she late every day? And so, yes answers. Okay, tend to move to an external attribution here. No answers. In other words, um, if I believe that, uh, when I say, do others behave? Yeah, if Tabitha is the only one late, then I'm going to start to believe that it's probably Tabitha. If uh, it's distinct, 
does a person behave differently in different situations? Oh, yeah, yeah. If she's only late for this class, then I'm going to assume it's a situational thing. And if uh, she's always late for this class, I'm going to assume it's Tabitha. Wait, that works? Whatever. But anyway, going through, the, we, we make these attributions in these three ways. And so here is a, uh, I, I really enjoy this particular um, table, I guess you'd call it. Um, I want you to read it, though. There's a lot of words, okay? But it's it, it takes it, this idea of a student falling asleep in my class, and I have to attribute it. Is it because this student is lazy, or is it because of some situation like they didn't get enough sleep last night, or am I just a boring lecturer? And my belief system will be based on this, um, this consensus, consistency, and distinctiveness factor. In fact, let's just look at the first one just very briefly. Um, so the student falls asleep. No other students fall asleep in my class. The consensus is low. This is the only kid falling asleep. Consistency. He falls asleep in previous classes. Okay, this is just what the kid does. Distinctiveness. He falls asleep in other people's classes as well. Therefore, this kid is just lazy. Okay, so we, we could break this down and then the attribution that we give will be based on our answer to those three questions. Uh, okay, here's one. Well, what they did was they manipulated the, uh, this person is going to be really warm or this person is going to be really cold, you know. They're, that's just who they are. And then they come in and give a, a presentation, and then they're rated. And lo and behold, if you expect them to be a warm person, you know, uh, by the way, note, it says the lower number equals more positive, okay? And if you expect them to be a, a warm person, then they are rated as more knowledgeable. They're rated as more considerate. They're rated as more informal. They're rated as more sociable. It doesn't matter what the, what the characteristics are. If you believe they're going to be a warm person, and they come in and give the exact same presentation, you're going to rate them in, in that manner. All right, whatever. All right, but this comes down to the fundamental attribution error. I am. Uh, this is a big one. This is, in many ways, the basis of, of many wars, many problems, many situations. Um, the tendency to, for observers to underestimate situational influences and overestimate dispositional influences. In other words... Tabitha comes in late to my classroom, and I automatically, the fundamental attribution error is the automatically jumping to Tabitha's lazy and um, ignoring the situation that she may well be in, okay? Um, say, for example, um, I taught one, what, uh, a couple of times I've taught multiple sections of general psychology. I remember I taught one at 9 a.m. and one at 11 a.m., and my 11 a.m. class was just so much better than my 9 a.m. class. And even though I know this stuff, I had this tendency to just believe that the 9 o'clock people were just lazy. No, it's 9 o'clock. And that's how they act at 9 o'clock. You know, that's just 9 o'clock behavior from a college student. Or this. I love this example right here. Where's my... Here's an image of a car, and you see it's at a Sitco there, and you see that selfish bastard, he's sitting at the back pump so that you can't get in there and fill your own car. You drive up, and you see that, and you're just like, what a selfish son of a bitch. I need gas. I need it badly. Why didn't that bastard pull forward? Okay? It's our automatic assumption automatic assumption to attribute to the uh, disposition, that person's disposition. They're selfish. Rather than consider... He, we totally failed to consider when this guy in this car drove up and in fact you know this situation you pull up and there's somebody in front of you at that front pump and then one second after you get out of your car the person in front of you pulls out and now you're like looking like an asshole right you know what I'm talking about all right so it's in human nature to automatically fall back on and this is what the fundamental attribution error is really all about uh -uh. This one is, uh, this is a good one. This one was a, uh, they took people and, and they, two people into an experiment and they randomly assigned them into the role of questioner and contestant, like in a uh, Jeopardy game or something. And so one person plays the role of the, the game show host or something, and one plays the role of the questioner. And so, of course, um, 
the, the game show host always knows the answers, right, because they have them on their little card. And so they play this little game, and of course the game show host knows every answer, okay? Now afterward, what's crazy, they have a third person or a group of people watching the little game show, and afterwards they ask them, you know, how smart are these people? And lo and behold, inevitably, they're going to rate the game show host as smarter than the game show contestant. And I was like, why are they smarter? Because they knew all of the answers. But the, you gave them to them. You, they, you gave them the answers. And what's really crazy is even the host and the game show contestant themselves will rate their intelligences accordingly. It's just the craziness, man. We just totally run dispositions. Even though we see the situation, we saw them randomly assigned. We saw all of these things. We can't, we cannot help but pull out a dispositional attribution. Even though we watch the situation unfold, why do we do it? Because um, we see the world differently. I mean, all I see, first off, all I see when Tabitha walks in my door is Tabitha walking in my door. I did not see Tabitha driving around the trying to find a parking space for 30 minutes. I don't see that stuff, okay? I see her walking in my door. That's all I see. Here, in fact, um, they've done videotaping of uh, confessions, police confessions. And they videotape it from two directions. One from the perspective of the detective doing the interviewing and one from the perspective of the uh, criminal or whatever you want to call it, person being confessed. And it's amazing because it could be the exact same exact same interaction that the videotape is from the side of the um, the uh, the detective doing the questioning then people say you know what that confession feels real but if it's the video camera is facing the other direction then it looks as though the confession is fake it's being uh, coerced or something we see the world in these different ways and and for me in my classroom I only see Tabitha walking in the door I do not know Tabitha's side of the story I just don't know the fundamental attribution error is less likely to occur as the more the more I understand and know your situation, the less likely the fundamental attribution error will be. It doesn't mean it goes away, right? Because it doesn't, but it becomes less likely. You said that. Self-fulfilling prophecies are a belief that leads to its own fulfillment. Okay. If a teacher here, Raina's older brother was brilliant. I bet she is too. Raina's just on track. Raina has got an easy street. From now on, her teacher expects more from her. Her teacher is going to perhaps, if Raina has a bad day, her teacher is much more likely to write it off as a bad day because her teacher expects Raina is going to be a good girl. Um, Raina's got it set, okay? The teacher smiles more at Raina teaches more, calls her more, gives her a little bit more time to answer. As I said, ignores perhaps, um, it, it discounts her negative behaviors, okay? And Raina responds enthusiastically, thus confirming what the teacher believed, okay? In a classic study, is that this one? No. In a classic study, Rosenthal and Jacobson, they went to these teachers and they uh, in the summer and they said, "Hey, you know, all of the students that you're going to have next year were tested, and um, this 20 percent, you know, these five kids in your class, their test results reveal that they're just ready to sprout this year. They're just they're they're going to bloom. They're going to really take off. And so, lo and behold, at the end of the year, the amount of improvement that those five kids gave was amazingly higher than the rest of the class. And, of course, the trick is that these 20% have been randomly chosen. And that's what a self-fulfilling prophecy really is, right? Uh, we have expectancies. This is uh, similar to a self-fulfilling prophecy. But, you know, this is in science. That is... Uh, they took these students in a class and they gave them rats for the class. This is back when experimental psych was actually called Rat Lab for a reason. And uh, they they were supposed to, you know, teach their ass how to run mazes and stuff. And uh, half of the kids were given them rats and said these rats were specially bred to be very smart. And half of them were told your rats were specially designed to be stupid, you know. And at the end of the semester, lo and behold, those, those kids who had the maze bright rats... Um, did in fact, their, their rats were much more successful at running the maze, you know? And how is that possible? How could that be? And it's very simple. It's because 
people expected it to be true, and so they they made it true. You know, I can just imagine um, in this scenario, if a, you know the girl gets a, the maze bright rat, and she's like, "Oh, I love you." If you got a smart rat. Shit, you name it, you turn it into a little pet, you'd hug it, you'd kiss it, trust me, you would. Um, but if you got a maze doll rat, you'd be like, stupid rat. You'd just, like, throw it in the maze or something. You wouldn't give it any affection, you wouldn't give it, you wouldn't, nothing. If you expect yours to be smart, you're going to give it all of the benefit of the doubt. You're going to perhaps, you won't start your stopwatch quite at the same time as you would in the other. It just... You're going to be, your expectation is going to create the reality, even in a scientific world. Uh, uh, oh, here's a really big one. I like this one. Let me see what it is. Yeah, this is a really big one. Okay. They took males and females, and they put them together for a phone conversation. Now, what they did, though, was they took photographs and... Of attractive women and unattractive women okay now they showed a picture to the man and said this is who you're having a conversation with okay and see they're an attractive or unattractive woman right and uh, now have your conversation okay and here's the deal is that uh, the pictures were absolutely unrelated to the women that they were talking to there was no relationship whatsoever the women on the other end of the line had no idea who, what kind of picture was presented and attached to their... They didn't know, okay? And so, lo and behold, in, in a not surprising way, if a man thought that he was interacting with a pretty girl, he was more flirtatious, he was more um, uh, sweet, more compassionate, more things like this. Um, after the conversation, the males completed a questionnaire. Uh, would you like to go on a date with them, etc.? And I mean, these aren't surprising things, no problem at all. But what's scary, what's really scary, is that the women, okay, what they then did was they took these conversations and they played them back to a third party, a person that had no idea what was going on, and they had them rate the women. And you know what happened is if the man in the conversation thought she was an unattractive woman, he treated her differently, she responded differently, and a third party raider said, I wouldn't want to date her. Okay, and so a third-party rater that had no idea about this whole photograph thing rates her as a le less attractive woman, even though there's no basis for that judgment except for the fact that the man in the conversation treated her differently and she responded accordingly. Okay, that's self-fulfilling prophecy. And then lastly, people often reveal their attitudes towards others through nonverbal cues. Again, we're going to talk about subtle racism later, uh, subtle prejudice rather. Uh, when people have a positive attitude towards another, they position themselves close, make a lot of eye contact, and then they pull back and stuff. So we're going to talk about, uh, we're, we're going we're to expand on these things as we go. Clearly, again, even here in Chapter 3, we're still talking about foundational material that is going to be uh, applicable across all the chapters in the book. At this point, I'm hoping that you'll uh, take a little shot and uh, listen to the Paper 2, Paper 2 Assignment lecture see how that one turns out all right a little blurb uh whatever i'll see you next time for chapter four